representing the internet. <laughs> representing the internet? Yeah. That's nice. On behalf of Zoom. Give it uh, like a minute or two, see if anybody else strolls in. Plus, you know, we'll just have to. <laughs> I figured there'd be at least six people. Well, I guess. Well, I don't want to count people who are contractually obligated to be here. So. <laughs> I'm thinking it's probably because of the rain. Yeah, I do very much. Right, let me know if anybody is actually watching this on the internet. <laughs> you don't know how to tap participants. Yeah, okay, look at the participants. Oh, under the participants thing, like pop yeah. that sucker open. You, me. Yeah, but there should be under the attendees. See where it says no, 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 no virtuals yet. Right, uh, it's running, right? Okay. Is this thing on? Yeah, nobody showed up. Well, I care That's about it. I care about Jerusalem. Again, you're contractually obligated to care. <laughs> used to run. Used to run the Drupal website. I mean, I didn't show up. I didn't charge the Drupal website. You got to tell me you spent some press. Oh, I run this. Oh, I I'll bet you. The, <laughs> all right, so let's get started anyway. So I'm just going to talk uh, probably uh, way too long about um, our journey on moving uh, Cali, the, the main Cali website, because we've got a few of them doing different things, but um, moving it to Drupal 9. Um, I think I can dispense with the first handful of slides. Hi, I'm Elmer. There's that. Um, who? Yeah, thank you. I'm the Director of Technology for the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. Um, we're a 503 nonprofit. We do all these things. Okay, so this is actually a, um, a map of our, our network infrastructure that serves up www.cali.org. Um, not counting all the development stuff, which sits in a different dimension. Um, and, uh, and, and we've actually used this architecture uh, forever, at this point, hmm. for a long time. So this is what powers seven. Um, nine is probably going to look, well, nine is going to end up looking pretty much the same way, right? The, the thing that might change is the, uh, <clears throat> let me see if I can get the, let's see if the green pointer works, does it? Yeah. So this right here, which is our static cache. Uh, bit that like caches all the JavaScript files and all that uh, style sheets and that sort of stuff. Um, that might change, although I don't know for sure, but it may. Um, but other than that, the rest of the architecture, is, uh, at, le at least at this level, is, uh, is pretty solid. So, And yes, we do run our own solar search engine. Yay! Yeah, I know, right? Because it's very cool. And, and of course, this is what the Cali homepage actually on occasion looks like. So, um, you know, that's that's nice. We'll we'll show you where we're going um, with that in, in just a minute. But the thing about moving from seven to nine is that um, it isn't so much Drupal itself, right? Because the the migration paths for that are, are relatively well trampled at this point. It's the custom coding stuff, right? So. Um, our biggest thing, which always amazes other Drupal people outside of our little realm, uh, when I when I show it, is the way that we handle user registration, right? So, um, for user registration, you have to have a an authorization code, which is just basically a little thing that that key for your school, essentially, that like links you with your school, but. But we don't allow people to register on the website without that, so that keeps our uh, uh, spam sort of stuff down to zero, which is nice because um, in past iterations of the Kelly website, 
we did allow for like anonymous, act, anonymous, like anybody could register. And that resulted in mayhem that tied up <laughs> like this hat. Um, it resulted in mayhem that uh, took me a long time to clean up. I you know, was spending tons of time doing that. And I was like, no, we can't. It culminated in, a, in an incident that was now like, well, it was, it was in, uh, yeah, it was 11 years ago. Uh, where like somebody decided, so it's a good story. Some lawyer in Texas decides he needs SEO. I, I, and apparently rather than, than talking to Tim, he uh, decided to freelance it. And it ended up in uh, some shop with offices in the Philippines and Malaysia. And they discovered that you could create accounts on the Cali website and add bios to those accounts that were, you know, that would hold basically anything um, up to like a thousand characters or something like that. So they created about 150,000 accounts <laughs> in about four days, loaded them up with bios of this lawyer all, that all linked back to his site. Now, of course, they were assuming that anybody was that Google cared about our site for the first, you know, in the first, which it didn't. So it was, you know, and so so I actually tracked this lawyer down and called him up after we started after we locked all this stuff out of the site, and I was like, "Dude, what were you doing?" He's like, "Well, I don't know. I like, you know, I, I just, you know, uh, I just I found them on the internet and they seem legit." And I'm like, "Excellent." And so. <laughs> Uh, so after that, we locked it down, and you could no longer, you had to have a, uh, an authorization code to register. And, and that served us quite well, because it just keeps the, the background noise out. Um, and, and I'm the envy of, of, of a lot of Drupal developers who are like, man, if we could keep annoying people off the site, that'd be pretty cool. I'm like, oh, well, we don't keep the annoying people out. They just have to have the, they just have the authorization code, but we keep everybody else out. Um, so that's worked out pretty well, um, and it does help us obviously with, with tracking usage for the membership and stuff, right? Because everybody who's there is linked to the school that they that they that they have their code uh, they have their code for. So, and then this is the actual code, or part of the code, I should say, <clears throat> that uh, that actually runs that um, that stuff and. It actually runs the, the Drupal 7 uh, custom module. And then there's like a bunch of database queries to make sure we've got all the, everything lines up and all that. The, the, um, the, uh, the authorization code is actually what's technically known as a natural key because it's, um, it's composed of other, of, of keys from other things, right? So the, the abbreviation from the law school and the uh, and the ID number from our administrative systems, plus like either fact or stu for student or faculty. So there isn't so it doesn't exist outside of little bits of programming, which is also fun. But that's actually a carryover from a security system, the system that we had before we went to Drupal. And I then that, that, but that's a now I'm just drifting. So, so there's, so there are a lot of custom modules. So this screenshot was actually taken last, uh, last summer. And since then, one of the things I've learned is we're getting rid. You know, I'm actually down to like really just like four of these custom modules. Most of them are getting are getting tossed out either because they're really Drupal seven specific that we don't need anymore. Some of them are wrapped up in things like. Um, like uh, are the migration ones on here? There were some from the Drupal uh, Drupal six migration that were still poking around. Those are gone. Um, there's stuff that just doesn't work, like this FAQ viewer thing. Um, oh, the DVD lesson library registration. Yeah, that was one of my favorites. Like we haven't done that, obviously. You know, we uh, put that stuff on disk in years. So I ended up with like uh, ultimately I'm working on just a few. The the user authentication. Uh, one, the lessons, which is how we control the lesson runs. Lesson link, which is the big faculty usage of stuff. And then the Cali Publisher modules module that lets us, that's really kind of like an API for our uh, authoring stack. 
So, um, and then uh, there might be one or two other ones, but those are the, the main ones. But it's still a lot. The lesson link module is about 2,000 lines. So it really needs to be broken up into like smaller things. And, and, uh, and some of them are going to get broken up because I'll talk about that in a second. But. So, so the questions about why, you know, <laughs> Elmer, why are you doing this? Um, so so uh, Drupal 7 is coming to the end of life. Now, it was supposed to be uh, November of this year. But uh, there are a lot of government Drupal 7 installations. So uh, they, they, it was originally supposed to be the, I think the first Drupal 7 end of life was November of 2022. And then they were like, okay, that's not going to work. So we're going to go November 2023. And then uh, last week at DrupalCon in Pittsburgh, because I almost did DrupalCon and then CaliCon so that I just, so I could do the Pittsburgh Philadelphia doubleheader, because I love that. Um, but, <laughs> but I opted not to. So, um, but uh, in Pittsburgh last week, they announced that they were going to carry it over, that now Drupal 7 with end of life, uh, at uh, on the interesting date of January fourth, twenty twenty five. So that's like literally like the day before we get a new president or or Biden gets reinaugurated. So I'm wondering if they're thinking, you know, if we just if we make this end with the current administration, then they can hand it off to somebody else, and then they can decide what to do with it, right? <laughs> I mean, there's a there are a lot of there are a lot of government Drupal powered government websites, and they're not all public facing, right? There's a lot of internal stuff. I mean, Drupal gets used a lot for um, gets used a lot for internal uh, websites. Because people load up like mountains of documents on it and stuff, and use it for you know all kinds of things. I mean, for a number of years, and I don't know if this is still true, but for a number of years, uh, Apple's HR site was Drupal power. Still is. Is it still? Yeah. So, um, and then of course, uh, PH, and another thing about it is it runs best in PHP 7.4, which has been end of life for a while now. Or, yeah, and it's going to keep getting deader. But, you know, they ain't used to running old software, so eh, it doesn't matter. Um, and Drupal 7 of course, been around for forever, so we need to get out of it. Um, so, you know, uh, people who aren't fans of Drupal, generally, were like, well, can't we just go to something else? I'm like, well, sure, but it's not any easier to go to something else. And I like Drupal, so there you go. So, so Drupal 9's got some interesting features in it that, um, that we're uh, planning on taking uh, full advantage of. Um, API stuff is built into the core now, so in Drupal 9. So you can create, um, you know, you can, uh, it, it becomes easy to create like custom APIs or you can use the built-in APIs. And then that allows you to do stuff like build alternate interfaces or, you know, provide the membership with the ability to draw stuff out, and, you know, and do stuff with it, um, you know, and that's, uh, and that's technically a good idea. Um, there is uh, better media handling. It, they're giving, it's got a media library like WordPress, uh, WordPress's uh, media library. Uh, not as good, as, but, <laughs> but there it is. Um, but it's better than the current media handling. Um, and, uh, and it does better with, um, with embedding video and audio from, you know, outside sources and stuff. So that's, that's always good. Um, they use, the, there's a thing called Layout Builder, which makes it easier to do sort of fancy pages, right? But I really want, I want to put this here and that there, and then there's got to be columns. And then, you know, some stuff. And can you do that? Like, sure. You just click on some things. And it'll, uh, it'll, uh, it'll work out. Um, and then there's uh, the mobile-first UI, so, so they've been really conscious about being able to have uh, the ability to, to make the, the, the websites uh, mobile-ready, uh, and that, that works out. Um, that actually works out pretty well, too. 
Um, there's some other stuff in the internals. Should have had another slide, I forget. Yeah, sure. So, uh, in terms of our custom modules, everything has to be rewritten pretty much from scratch because even though I followed, um, I followed Drupal best practices, um, a lot of the stuff that I relied on no longer exists or it completely changed, right? So, no more menus, it now actually uses routers. It's very much a, a model view controller, object oriented. And it uses Symfony as the framework. So, so it sort of, uh, you can no longer do straight procedural PHP programming quite so effectively without running afoul of like all kinds of stuff. So, um, so that's making me re rewrite everything and learning a whole new PHP style that I've avoided for a long time because, well, because it's not Java, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. So, um, but that's fine. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm plowing through on it and, and, uh, and you know, trying to, trying to get a handle on it. So, in addition to the, uh, in addition to the, uh, uh, the custom module work, you know, we had, a, we have a lot of data, right? So, there are a little over half a million users, give or take, uh, user records. Um, we've got a bunch of modules, or a bunch of uh, nodes, all of our, you know, all the lessons, all the e-linked outlooks, all the crossword puzzles, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, it was really the user part that um, was a big deal. Because not only do we have users, but we keep a lot of fields, which we're trimming down, but So the data migration tools for like just doing like a straight up migration, um, you know, work. Uh, actually, they worked surprisingly well. Um, once I figured out some stuff, um, like uh, there's two different uh, there's two different versions of the migration tools which have different command line options, but they're the same name. And one works really well in Drush, which is the command line interface for, for Drupal. Um, and one works really well in the web, um, which is susceptible to, of course, things like timeouts because you can't keep a browser window open forever while it turns around in the background, right? So, um, uh, but, um, so it actually took a little bit of, um, of sort of poking at it to get the right mix of what I wanted to do. Because I could generate reports really well in one and then execute them in the other one. And it was, it was, um, you know, it was, it was a little hairy. But the biggest thing about it, once it started to run, um, was the amount of time that it takes, right? Because it would, you know, it was churning through uh, hundreds of thousands of database records, for example, while it was migrating the user stuff. Um, and, uh, and that just took time, right? So, uh, the first time I did it, it took about four days, um, and almost caused me to melt my laptop because <laughs> it was not pro quite up to it. Um, I re-ran it again after I built this, which if you were in my session yesterday, you recognize as Kelly's Deep Learning work Workstation. But, the thing is, is that it's very fast and it has lots of memory, which w when you're working with MySQL is actually a plus. So it's actually able to run all the conversions in a couple of hours when it was loaded into that kind of space. Now, the problem with that is that that made me realize that uh, that, that, that uh, the, the architecture that we're using is fine, but it's undersized. Right, so the MySQL server, is John here? The MySQL server that we're using is way too small for what we should be doing, right? So it's going to need to be bigger. And Dan, what does bigger mean on Amazon? Much more costly. That's right, much more money. <laughs> so, so we're going to, you know, we'll, we'll be sorting that out. But the, um, the sort of performance gains that you get from having that available all the time are 
um, you know, are like really kind of cool. So um, not that it's pokey now, right? I mean, you know, it's sized okay. But when we're doing, like, especially when we do, like, we do regular reports to, you know, let the uh, membership know, like, how many runs there are and stuff. And those are a little slow, right? Um, and they're so slow that we don't make them available to the to the membership like directly. They have to contact us because if they like kick off something, it's going to time out on the web before it before it finishes. So what we're going to do, or what I want to do as we move to Drupal nine, is beef up the size of that um, the the available memory and processor power for the database so that we can give that more directly to the membership so that they can click a button and get the report pretty quickly. Um, and it'll speed up stuff like our lesson live system, um, which works pretty well, but it'll be a lot more instantaneous um, and those sorts of things. So there's that. Tom, you look like you have a question. Do you have a question? Well, I'm, I'm just thinking that there are any number of database front ends that will let a user submit a request and then email the result sometime oh, yeah, later, yeah, yeah. Uh, which might solve your problem a slightly different way. Yeah, yeah, it might. Yeah, but I've seen the speed. Now I have to have the Ferrari. <laughs> That's what I figured, actually. <laughs> um, and, you know, I mean, well, it's like one of those things. I mean, there's not so so the the and, and part of it is that the database has grown in size um, over time, so that it's now substantially larger than the 32 gig of physical RAM or however Amazon apportions memory. Right? Is that school information or user information? It's a combo, right? I mean, why so, can't you age out the user information? We can age out. So, so there's there's some it's things. Been, uh, law school lasts for three years. Yeah, I know. Law school <laughs> lasts three years. Yeah, but the, the thing the thing about the, the there's historical value, and mostly it's the lesson run table, uh, right? Okay. Which doesn't which I've not wanted to um, to age out. Now we partition that, although it needs to be repartitioned because it's been a while. But we repartition that by date, and that actually that's actually what keeps things actually running, right? Because if you partition by date, and then you always use a date qualifier in your, in your SQL query, it'll go right to that partition and run the queries there. So it'll skip the prior, like, you know, uh, what is there? There's, I mean, we've got, the lesson run table goes all the way back to 2004, right, or thereabouts. Um, so, uh, and, you know, and, and I don't want to, like, drop some of that, but I do want I do want better performance. So partitioning gets us part way there, and then actually being able to like load the whole thing into memory would be kind of awesome, as opposed to keeping it physical, or as opposed to like having it swapping in and out of out of disk. I mean, that's another thing I learned from the you know the the deep learning stuff was like you know anytime you're crossing, I mean it's the thing you know right if you anytime you've got to cross from one you know, thing to another, that means time, right? And if you do it enough, things get slow. And, uh, and if you've got all of, uh, you know, that's why the deep learning stuff, for example, all takes place on that video card. Um, because then there's no, there, all the bus issues are contained in the piece of molten lava that mm -hmm. used to be, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not swapping out across the, across the, uh, across the bus to the, to the physical memory, or to the, or to, uh, to anything else, and or to the CPU, and that helps it all move faster. And you know, anyway, so that's where I'm, I'm sort of at with that. But hey, who knows? <clears throat> so, um, so I've been gathering all the stuff up in a uh, in a book, well, sort of a book. But so, so this is. Uh, this is where I keep like you know, I keep all my notes and stuff, and how I've been going through the the, the Drupal nine uh, process. It's actually out of date a little bit because you know you can program, you can write documentation. I think I said that yesterday. And, you know, so, um, but a lot of this is just grabbed web pages and stuff um, from different uh, different sources anyway. But I've pulled it all together in um, this is a WordPress 
set of WordPress plugins called Pressbooks um, that we use to power uh, some of our Elaine Dell stuff. So, but it's also handy for this. Um, so there's uh, you know there's a there's a bunch of stuff about you know how to move things and and it's also out of date now because of course everything's got to go to Drupal 10. Um, but one thing that I've discovered, thankfully, is is that um, there there aren't uh, there aren't any real changes to the APIs between 9 and 10. The difference is the version of Symfony um, that uh, the framework that sits underneath everything. So, um, so the coding standards don't aren't changing from 9 to 10 in any significant fashion. So, um, everything in my testing so far indicates that I can write. Yeah, I can use either the docs for 9 or 10, and it'll run on 9 or 10. It doesn't, um, it doesn't make a difference. And I've actually spun up Drupal 10 to, just to make sure that what I'm doing is, is going to work. Because by the time I get done, because my current target um, is to disregard the extra year of uh, Drupal 7 and, and try and get this done by the end of this year. Um, and we'll... Uh, because then that way, because uh, I've already pushed that deadline a couple of times, and I, I prefer to just get it done. Um, and so we're gonna we're gonna hang on to that. But by, even by the end of this year, all the, the momentum should have shifted to Drupal 10, because that's where they want you to go. But the upgrade process, it looks like they solved. Because if you've been doing WordPress for a long time, you know that like WordPress has just been. I mean, we run Classcaster which is a WordPress uh, network install. And, um, and that actually started out in WordPress, like it, that actually started its life as WordPress like 3.5 multi-user or something like that. And it's currently running, I know it was running 6.1. I'm not sure if I upgraded the, the, to 6.2. It will upgrade to 6.2, but that's all just been done in place, right? The only real issue that I've had is, um, there was a, there were some bumpy spots in, in uh, going into Drupal or into WordPress four, where it was uh, how it handled the multi-site install stuff. That was a little tricky, but we got through that, and now it just got you know uh, it just it just pretty much runs, including some very old and very creaky uh, WordPress uh, database authorization plugins that I run to authorize it against uh, Drupal. By the way. Um, but that, those are going to, those might have to go away anyhow because the, the or they'll have to be rewritten because the Drupal 9, uh, the things that we do to get to use the, the Drupal user stuff in other things, you can't do in Drupal 9. Well, you could, but you really shouldn't. So, um, so we're going to have to change a couple of our authorization level stuff on, on, on a couple of different things like the authoring platforms in WordPress. But. So that's where Drupal wants to go, right? That's sort of like one button update. And, um, and it looks like uh, with 10, I think it looks like they'll have achieved that. Although it's hard to tell. I mean, it's such a big, sprawling kind of thing. Uh, you know, it's hard to tell where, you know, what's getting left behind and, uh, and what's not. So. Um, so some of the tools that I've been using, um, D, there's a, a system called DDEV, um, which makes, uh, which works really well, well on Windows. Dan, did you ever get it run on the Mac? Yeah. And Dan got it run on the Mac. There you go. So on Windows, it uses uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux too. So I'm actually working in Ubuntu, right? Um, and then a Docker. To, to set up and basically it's really easy. You run and it actually is really easy. Like sometimes you say that and it's like yeah, but it actually is pretty straightforward. I mean, you set up a, a, a YAML file because that's what the world needs, more YAML files. And uh, but for the you know for the for the custom setup and the thing is it allows you that that gets into the Git repos, and then um, and then that allows us to set up identical development environments. And, as we'll see in a second, it'll also allow for us to have a, a, a production environment that looks just like the development environments. The goal being to eliminate 
but it works on my laptop, which is not a... <laughs> which, granted, has actually been less of a problem for us because I'm kind of the only one actually doing the development, so I'm very conscious about that. Um, you know, uh, but it does, uh, you know, sometimes we do hear, uh, you know, we'll hear stuff from Sam. Well, it works over here. Like, well, okay. Um, so then we're using Git and GitHub. Those are two different things, you know, right? You know, Git and GitHub aren't exactly, you know, the two different, okay. Just checking. Um, but we're using GitHub workflows to, to manage deployment. So when I, uh, when I finish off, uh, when, I, when I do a, uh, well, the way that it's set up and it actually works right now is when I commit something to the development branch of our D9 uh, uh, tree, it automatically deploys it to a deployment thing. Because the thing is, is that with, with Drupal 9, because it's using Symfony and, and the way that that's put together, like you really only need to move around um, like the configuration files, essentially, right? And it'll build what you need without all of the weird development stuff that you might have, right? And so that's what this workflow does. It essentially, it does a build of Drupal that's production ready. And, um, and it doesn't have all of the things like the .ddev files and, and all the configuration stuff that you, don't, that you shouldn't have on production anyway get left out of the build. And it'll also do stuff um, like it builds the, the custom theme work, which we'll take a short peek at a little bit in a second, um, and, and that sort of stuff. And so, so when you make those changes, they just propagate right through. And it works, which is always a good thing. Yes, Tom? See, I can always say, oh, he doesn't have anything this time. All right. So, uh, and, then, um, and then I added... Visual Studio Code here, because for a long time we used Komodo IDE, um, like a long time, like ten years, I've been using it. I've been using it, and then they announced they were open sourcing it. It's like, ooh, cool, and abandoning it all at the same time. Yeah, so <laughs> um, basically, so, good luck, suckers. Yeah, pretty much, <laughs> right? Um, so, and so the first thing I did was went and canceled my annual maintenance agreement, which, by the way, they weren't going to automatically cancel. They would keep taking my money because I looked into it. And they're like, luck well, and it's going to cost you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're like, well, because, you know, that actually covers some of our other products, too. But it's like, no, but I don't use, I don't use your other products, right? So, so I knew that. So, um, and, and, I, and I had used Visual Studio Code on, like, some side, like, some personal stuff and everything, and it's fine. It does everything that, that I want it to do. You have to look past the part that belongs to Microsoft, but but it plugs into the Git repos and it, and it handles all that stuff. So I've been I've been transitioning over to that. I'm pretty I'm pretty pretty much that's pretty much what I use all the time. Actually, the presentations are written in Visual Studio Code because I do them in a text format called ASCII Doctor, and then Turn them in the slides. It works pretty well. It's all right. Um, okay, so here's sort of a demo. Because <laughs> I know this is what you've been waiting for. So, so we had some, um, some custom theming work. This is a static page, by the way. But, um, so so, we, so uh, we had been working for a number of years with a, with a consultancy called Media Current who um, uh, helped us move the, uh, the award system over to Drupal. Um, and then we, we had them do a uh, Drupal 9 slash 10 like theming scheme. Um, and and this, is, this is like sort of the, the, the front page as envisioned by their, uh, their designers. Um, and it's not, you know, we liked it. Um, you know, and, uh, and plus, plus we, we have, we have a, you know, we, we get the we get the feature. Uh, for some reason, they picked Russ Weaver as as the, the the law faculty person that they would stick on the front page of the website. But the idea is is like a lot of these can be changed easily. So you have your sort of you know stuff turning up all the, in all different ways. So 
and then and then I, I, I was especially I was especially fond of the 3D version of the Elaine Dell books because that's kind of cool, right? Because um, you don't you just don't see that because they don't exist in 3D for the most part. Um, so uh, you know, so that's kind of cool. And some elements of this are all, we we brought into the Drupal Seven uh, theme like right away, like the little uh, the little icon little icon guys turn up you know, on the current website and the colors and, and that sort of stuff are, are there. So um, so this is like theoretically what it'll look like when it's all done. So I've got like mo so so I've got the basic theme. And so I did so when I ran the uh, when I ran the import it actually moved a whole bunch of stuff over and I have like a working Drupal uh, skeleton. Drupal 9 of like our website, right? Nope, this is not real. That's there for all the people who show up and go, oh, let's run lessons here. No, they can't, because this is technically available, excuse me, publicly on the web, but. And you'll notice that the, uh, that the, uh, that it doesn't have, it's not quite as snappy, <laughs> but we do have some of the elements. Um, so, so one of the interesting things about doing the doing the migration was was that it actually brought in like all of the fields, including the fields that that would turn up with the uh, to somewhere. Oh, by the way, so so the in, so none of the interior theming was done, right? So, so we have like that theming for like the 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 um, you know we have we have basically header theming, and we have uh, some footer theming. But there's no like sort of you know no forms have been themed, no contents been themed, um, all that sort of stuff. But one of the interesting things that it did in the migration was this: the authorization code space, right, which is right here, right. I mean that's a custom field from a module, right, for the from our authorization module that's injected into the form. Well, the way that it but that, well, when you run the module, it defines the field in the database as a field for the, uh, as a field for the, um, for the system, for the uh, registration page. And so when it when it when it was doing the migration, I found out that it picked up all of these custom fields and moved them, which is nice, except for the fact that it's now in the way, right? Because now this is a system field that I need to rewrite to do something else. And so it actually makes it a little bit more complicated. It would have been easier if I was just injecting something directly into the, um, into the, into the form like I did in Drupal 7 in the first place. So, but that's all, um, you know, just more stuff to do. Um, so, uh, let's see, can we see? Yeah, so we've got, I mean, it moved over our taxonomy terms, right? So we've got, um, we've got contracts, and then we've got, um, we have our subject outlines. It brought all the content over. Um, it brought over the uh, lesson. So this is like the lesson page. Um, and, uh, but again, there's no run button, which is, a, a, well, I'm not logged in. <laughs> Um, but you don't have the you don't have the little alert that says you know if you're not logged in you can't see anything. Um, I didn't bring over pictures and stuff, but it grabbed the uh, you know all the bio stuff. I mean, it did a really good job of moving everything over. And the other thing that it did was they kept all the IDs, um, which is really important because a lot of these ID numbers are very old. I know Jennifer's is old. Um, this should be right. So, so I'm user 140 in the system, right? That the first uh, first couple of thousand user IDs actually came from Levon's old Access database of keeping track of people. It's Levon's Levon uh, used to be our membership person, and um, and she had an, an old Access database. It was essentially a contact system. And I used that to populate the first system that I built for Cali, like back in 2004, when we start ramping this up. 
and we've carried those ID numbers forward so that we've been able to preserve the integrity of like the lesson run table. And the same thing with the um, with the uh, ID numbers for the uh, for the lessons themselves, right? So um, you know this has been this has been lesson four thirty four um, for a very long time, right? I mean we've just we've carried those numbers through um, from Again, from an access database, especially for the for the uh, for uh, probably about the first 750 lessons, they were in access or they were in a spreadsheet that Sam had, and um, you know, and then they went through our custom built system, which we ran for a number of years, and uh, then they were moved into Drupal five, and then six, and then seven, and now they're going to nine and ten. So that's another reason why that lesson run table, though huge, um, is still valid. Because we've kept those IDs uh, going back in uh, going back in time like that, so it just you know it needs some work um, in terms of, of getting the uh, the thing done. We can um, log in because one thing that we did. Let me see if I can remember. Let's see if I got this. Oh, I missed it. One more time. Did that not work either? Oh man. Okay, let me try it one more time. Okay, I don't have the cat box on. Ah, there we go. So uh, one thing that it did do, or that we've got, is um, it has a new administrative theme, which is nice. And so you can see all of the, I mean, this is all the stuff that, that did make it over, um, which is most things. Um, so the administrative back end is, um, is different. Um, but that theme works. So we can get through and look at the, I mean, it brought over our custom content types. All the weird fields that we use with those. Um, like lessons. Um, one thing that I haven't figured out yet is it's how I'm going to handle is they uh, got rid of, um, they changed the, uh, 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 the group uh, features to actual groups from. So, and, and so it's not it's not a direct it's not a direct thing. I'm working on that, but um, but yeah, I mean, it moved over all the fields, it populated everything, and uh, and it was plenty fast once it got enough oxygen. So, um, yeah, so there's there's that. Uh, let's see here, and then oh, that would be that. I think I'm just about yeah, clean your room. Yeah, let's get that. Oh, that's the end. Um, <laughs> well, that's perfect. 45 minutes, right? Da ding, give or take. Um, any questions? Did anyone uh, show up on the internet? Uh, yeah, we had somebody show up. I don't know if she's still there. <laughs> I don't know if they're still there. They did not. No, no questions. No questions from the internet. Any questions from Peanut Coward? Yes. Just a bit curious about um, your experience with light HTTPD uh, web server. Uh, I've never used that one before. Is it pretty similar config to Apache or Nginx? Or so heard about it a lot. Yeah, I mean, it, it sets up pretty similar to, more similar to Apache than Nginx. That's what its name kind of betrays. Yeah. Yeah, and um, and and it was. Uh, so, so doing static caching for Drupal, there, there are a number of different techniques, but because we used, because most of our traffic, most Drupal sites are built around lots of anonymous traffic and just a handful of actual users like doing things, right? Usually content creators and that sort of stuff. And um, we're the, the flip of that, which is you need to be logged in to do anything on the site. And there's a lot of those, right? All the students, all the faculty, all of us. And anonymous folks can do little. And most caching, at least up to uh, seven, 
a lot of the caching stuff was built around speeding up anonymous access. So it didn't do us any good. Um, the 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 uh, the lighty stuff let us do um, to cache static files specifically, and like I was dubious at first, like because it's actually an Apache uh, proxy that hands this stuff off, and then the other web server serves it up, and I'm like, this cannot be faster, right? And sure enough, it was faster. And it just has something to do with the way that, that Apache deals with static files, which is just also weird. But, you know, so, so it's been fine. But we haven't really, I mean, we don't really use it in the sense that we don't even touch it. I mean, yeah. The, yeah. The, the reason we actually use it is because it's faster than Apache. Yeah. 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 It shows up, it's a little quicker. Yeah. So. And, 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 um, and now, again, the caching schemes are all changing in, um, in Drupal 9. So I might revisit that. I'm not sure that it'll work like it does now. So, um, so I have to take a look at that. But yeah, I mean, I mean, we use it, but I haven't even looked into it. In, I'm not even sure. Well, it's probably out. Of, it's probably an old version. Too. <laughs> no, I think I keep but it you keep it up to date. Yeah. yeah, it's on a new box. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. We did that. Yeah. So, uh, anything else? Anybody? Anyone? Wow. Well. It's you know, one thing more about the uh, uh, the Cali Deep Learning Workstation, but uh, that's probably <laughs> off topic. That sounds really cool. Well, if nobody else has any other questions, I'll talk about that. What do you want to What do you want to know? <laughs> oh, just uh, how much uh, like how much RAM it's got? How many cores? Is it pretty beefy? Uh... So let's scroll. Whoop! There it went. So so it's a so the the CPU is a Ryzen nine. Uh, 7950X. No, not the, wait, the X is the one without the, yeah, it has, it's a 7950, so it has the graphics available. And I did that so that I didn't have to do anything with the video card, right? So, so, so I, I, I the, the graphics to run a monitor, uh, you know, well, work through the, the CPU instead of the, the dedicated graphics so I can hold up on that. Mm -hmm. So, and that's like, I think that's, I want to say it's 32 cores, 64 threads, I think, something like that. It's like you do, you do uh, like H top and like you get like, oh, here's all the, all the cores. And then there's only room for like three processes. Right. And, the, and they're all sitting there. By the way, you've got like all these cores and like you don't do any. I mean, it, it, they sort of sit there. But um, so there's that. Um, the motherboard is a, I forget what brand it is. Um, wait, maybe you can tell. No, you can't. Can't tell, but it's a. It might be an Asus. It might be an Asus motherboard, um, and it's the uh, the AM5, the uh, you know for the for the, the chip and um, and it. But it handles 128 gig of RAM. So I went ahead and put in 128 gig of RAM because you need all the RAM. I mean, 128 gig of RAM. It's not even like it's so cheap, right? It's, it's even. It's like it's kind of silly. Um, there is a, uh, there's a one terabyte, you can see the, the, the drive sitting under the, the cover, uh, just below the CPU there. Um, that's a one terabyte little key drive thing. And then there's a second two terabyte solid state drive sitting off uh, someplace else inside the case. Um, and they're uh, both uh, pretty fast. I mean, using those... Uh, what is that, M2 or something like that, whatever the drive specification yeah. is. Yeah, those M2 drives, it's, I mean, it's sitting, it's literally, you can, if you look at the motherboard, you can actually see all the lanes and all the things running like directly from that socket, like this far into the, into the CPU. So you know that it's just like, it's just all sitting there. Um, the video card is an MSI uh, RTX 4070 Ti. So it has uh, 12, 12 gig of, of uh, VRAM, um, and it's in a PCI 416 slot. So again, lots of bandwidth between the slot and the, and the processor if you need it. Um, and uh, it's got an 850 watt power supply on it. Um, well, I went big because I was concerned about, I know I'm going to have to, I need a bigger video card, right? 
the, the 12 gig is not, like I thought I could get away with it. And I was, I can. So, you know, the stuff, the stuff I'm running, um, you know, will, I can get it to fit in the 12 gig card and so that, that's fine. Um, but I'm probably gonna look at replacing that with maybe a 3090, which has 24, Actually, I won't replace it. I'll just add the, tw uh, the 39 in because that's got 24 gig of RAM. It's technically a little bit slower, but it has more uh, CUDA cores than this does. Um, and, but the price is about the same. It's like uh, about 900 bucks. That's what this was, too. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so that's, um, and then that's pretty much, and it's in like, you know, a big, like a full ATX, or AT, is it AT, full, a full AT case, which they only make out of glass anymore, like, hi, I'd like a beige box. No, you don't. <laughs> because if you just have a beige box, how are we going to see the pretty lights? So, like, can I get them without the pretty lights? Like, no, you can't. You need pretty lights. Um, the CPU, uh, the CPU actually has a, a liquid cooler on it, and so there's a 360, so off the top of the thing, there's a 360 uh, millimeter, a three fan radiator sitting up there that keeps the GP and CPU cool. Um, I need to add more fans, there's room in the bottom and the sides and everywhere else to add, because I need more fans to keep, the, especially if I had a second video card in there, but I, even for that. I mean, it gets super hot pretty fast. Like, it, it'll, it'll run up to, uh, I've had it run in at, like, sustained temperatures for short spans of, like, 79 degrees Celsius, which is a little warm. I mean, its operating range is about 90, so it's still below that. But when you start running it, what I discovered, at, like, 75, 77, I had a job going, should have taken... 44 hours after 11 hours of being at like 74 to 75 degrees Celsius, it just went and cut out. It's like, we're done. We're just going to, we're going to lay in the corner over here, which is good because it's getting hot in my office. And he, well, the external temperature on the top of the case where the radiator was, was, was blowing stuff out was 96 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a little warm. So, um, yeah, so, uh, so there's that. Um, and then, uh, so the whole thing's running, uh, I've got like a Ubuntu 22, I think, running on it, so no windows. Um, I have been tempted to, uh, go out and get a, um, another, uh, another, like a terabyte hard drive and a Windows license, right. so I could run games on it, but, <laughs> but I have not, I've been good. <laughs> Um, well, I've, I've got my own gaming computer, which is fine, but, um, you know, just to see what I could do. Yeah. Uh, but, um, and, and so it's, it's pretty snappy. So when I'm doing like, like Drupal development and like the, uh, the database stuff, it's like super, super cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can always tell when something's running because the, the fans crank up and then, you know, uh, as soon as it as soon as it takes off, so yeah. awesome. Thank you. And I started like I, I started pulling together the list of stuff from um, what is it like PC Parts Picker? Is that the yeah, yeah that PC Parts Picker? But I ended up finally using because like rather than ordering stuff here and there online, I just like I have a micro center which is actually closer to Dan than me, but. Um, but there's a micro, there's a couple micro centers in Atlanta. So I went in and, and actually used their uh, builder, which is actually nicer than their website, by the way. I know. Um, so uh, to build out the, the the PC itself, and then we just went and, uh, and picked up the parts. I mean, the, the pricing is you know is always kind of a wash, so it doesn't doesn't make a difference. But it was easier rather than waiting for bits and pieces to come in the mail. With you know, hmm? you got a micro center. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Micro Center's cool. I like Micro Center. So, yeah, so there's that. All right. Uh, anybody else? Anything else? Good. Anybody want to see the, uh, the, the AI that's currently running? 
So, right, and you have to promise not to set off the smoke alarms in my house. <laughs> oh, by the way, we do own the domain name Cali.ai. Thank you very much. Uh, so, and we've had it for a couple of years. I was waiting for stuff to catch up with me. <laughs> well, the whoever the, the, the uh, you know, like, well, it's not with GoDaddy, it's with somebody else. But, like, they sent me an email, like, hey, you have a lot of domains registered somewhere. We've got .ai. Do you want some? And I was like, sure, how about Cali.ai? Because I figured four letters, short for California, not going to be available, right? And there it was. I was like, okay, I'll take that. So the whole thing goes south. Oh, so I asked the local, uh, my, my local chatbot, what's the Legal Information Institute? Tom, why don't you read that for us? So they <laughs> <laughs> group of law librarians, huh? Yeah, group of law librarians. They have a vast collection. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of funny, isn't it? Um, so, uh, yeah, during yesterday's talk, I was I was going to use these parts, but but I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't. So, um, but yeah, I, and so it's fun. You can ask it stuff. I have to be careful about asking it programming questions, but that's okay. Um, yeah. So this is my favorite because I've been talking to it about living trust, and so I said, "Give me some cases," and it did. And they're as accurate as the ones that lawyer used in the brief. <laughs> so the interesting thing about it is, is that there is a case, RE Estate of Fair in California. Uh -huh. So, but it's not from 2017, it's from 97, right? Uh -huh. In 2017, there were cases dealing with living trust. Like it pulls, it's pulling stuff, right? And, um, and, and however it, it sorts through the word pile, um, you know, it, it, it sort of ends up mashing a whole bunch of stuff together um, in ways that, that are just um, just kind of exciting. But some of the stuff that you can do, like it, I asked it to give me a, a you know a, a basic syllabus for uh, was this prizes property? Yeah, act like a law professor. Yeah, for property law, and it's actually not a bad syllabus, you know, in sort of the broadest sense. <laughs> You know, um, I could work with it. So, um, and I always ask them what against what's the rule against perpetuities. <laughs> so, so one of the interesting things was I had another one of these running, and and um, and and I and I would you know every time I started it, you know it was it would start fresh, right? So, uh, so I start by asking it about the rule against perpetuities. One day it decides that. This is a core tenet of corporate law in America, <laughs> and it's about how it's about how corporations can't live forever. So that's a much better vision of America than we actually have. <laughs> but the, and, and I couldn't get it to shake it until I turned it off. Like like he got this idea, and, and it keeps that context. And you couldn't like I said, well that's not correct. And then it just gave me something about how long nonprofits could last. I was like, no, that's that's not it either. It never got back around to the actual rule. So, you know, it's always, it's always fun. But um, this interface is, is kind of interesting, too. But there's a lot going on here. We can ask it. One of the interesting things you can do with this is you can, you can click the impersonate button. And we'll wait here for a second. We hit, oh, it's almost lunchtime. But it'll actually come up with its own question based on, like, what you've been talking about. Um, and then you can, and you can get it to answer it. And, uh, but we'll see. We'll see what it, because I've been asking it some different things, we'll see what it kind of comes up with. Sometimes they're a little, they've been a little odd. So, the other, the other thing about this interface, so this is a, 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 a particular set of programs, but it has this, it has this character gallery that the guy built. So, so, so this is, this is the example that he includes. So, so, the guy built this to get some of these large language models to participate in role playing. And exactly what the nature of the role playing is, I really don't want to hesitate, you know, I don't want to think about. It. But in all of his examples and stuff, he uses various anime girls as the, the character. Yeah, <laughs> so, but you know, we don't ask questions. 
Uh, so let's see. Oh, what is the purpose of the Legal Information Institute? That's a good one. Let's ask that question. It'll take a second. I think, uh, yeah, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. Why don't we ask Tom? Tom, quick, think faster than the AI and tell us what <laughs> is the what is the purpose? What do you think it's going to say based on the previous on the previous answer? Yeah, so this is another one of the things. Uh, it's taking a little longer today. Although often when it takes a while, you get better answers. So I I, I can tell you two words or three words. It's a boondoggle, actually. <laughs> I'm a, oh, here we go. Oh, there you go. Do you want, you want to copy that for marketing purposes? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm retired. Give it, give it to him. <laughs> Got it. All right. I think we're done. Yeah, I think so. Are we still recording? Yeah.